you may continue. Okay, well, it's really lovely to be with you all. And um, dear Brenda, you're such a, an amazing warrior for this nation, Brenda, and very beloved by many, many people, including myself. So thank you for all you do. We really appreciate you and love you. Bless you. Well, it's um, it, it's great to be here. And I'm going to share one of my favorite subjects today because it's something that always burns in me. So I, I just want to share it with you. But Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he said that all the scriptures were written about him and he opened them up and he said it, he fulfills all things in all ways. And I think that is just so important for us to really get hold of because the scriptures he opened up, of course, were not the New Testament. They were the Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't even written then. And in Colossians 2, 17, it says this, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And I love that. The reality is found in Christ. Um, many years ago, and uh, some on this platform will know only too well, we had a, a full-size tabernacle, which I know sounds crazy and it was crazy it was massive it filled practically a football pitch and uh, all the um, beautiful furniture and the drapes and people thought we were crazy especially you know a group of um, gentile women my Jewish friends and obviously thought I was completely mad to have this and they couldn't believe it until they came and saw it but it was extraordinary because when we went through it, we would point always to a greater reality. And every single part of it related to that greater reality, which is in Christ Jesus. And I, because of, of being in that tabernacle, the whole atmosphere really um, spoke to me. And, and I think when you see something visually, it, it penetrates in a, a different way really and of course we had the ark of the covenant and we had the holy of holies and uh, it was just uh, uh, such an amazing um, item to have we still have the furniture and we have the drapes and we can sort of do it but we haven't got the full size outside court anymore it was just too big and too crazy to try and maintain but I often used to think when I was in there that, you know, it says in the book of um, Hebrews that Moses was told to make an exact replica of the one he saw in heaven. And I've asked myself so many times, what was he seeing in heaven? What was that tabernacle in heaven like? And it was as if Moses had to kind of pull it down and put it on the face of the earth. And um, that has just captured me for so, so many years. But really what I want to talk today about is the priesthood of believers, because I feel that out of everything, this is probably the most important commission that we have from God to be a priesthood to him. And a priest, their calling is to minister to God and to minister to others. And that surely is the first and the second commandment. First, love the Lord your God and second, you know, people like yourself. And so to me, the priesthood has always been something that just totally, totally absorbs me. And uh, my, my friends will know that I quote this so often from Exodus 19, where God says to Moses, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And um, this chapter is so important to the Jewish people. This is the place where they believe God married Israel, and that's a whole other teaching. But it's such an important, pivotal chapter 
And uh, it, it's always been, I think, my favorite in the Old Testament, to be honest with you. And what we have to remember is when Moses was told to go to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may come and worship me on the mountain. And out of that worship, then they would have the promised land. And everything stems from our worship of God first. And then uh, we can move into his purposes. And so this moment was the, the moment they were at the foot of the mountain. And God's promise to them was that they were going to be his people, this chosen people, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, a people set apart for God. And um, at that moment, I truly believe that was the call for the whole nation. Because we, at this point, present moment in time at the foot of that mountain they did not have the levitical priesthood they did not have judah separate part to be kingly they were all called to be a priesthood of believers and um, it goes on in in 1913 it says only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain and so I believe there was a window of opportunity when they could go up the mountain and become this royal priesthood. They had to wait for that long blast of the trumpet before they could go up. But God said they could go up. And in Deuteronomy 5, 4 to 5, it says, the Lord spoke to, this is Moses saying to them, the Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. And at that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And the, the key word in that 19 passage was, if you obey me fully. And I don't believe they did obey him fully. They did not go up the mountain when that opportunity arose. And I think that's a very poignant message for us. While there's an opportunity, a wind of opportunity, let us take that opportunity and go up the mountain. And uh, we know that, you know, as the story progresses, they made the calf and it was awful and they all worshipped the calf and Moses came down and Moses then said to them, who is with me? And the tribe of Levi, his own tribe, came and stood with Moses. And because they stood with Moses, I believe that's when God said that will be my priestly tribe, they will be the ones to minister to me. And of course, then we know that Judah would be the kingly um, tribe. But the important thing for us to remember is that there is a priesthood that is far greater, far bigger, and far more powerful than the Levitical priesthood. And that was the priesthood of Melchizedek. And I, I really believe that that was the priesthood that God wanted the children of Israel to be part of, because um, they were going to be a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. And Melchizedek, when he came to Abraham, this king and priest of Salem, carrying bread and wine, foreshadowing the um, obviously the communion that we take now, you know, Jesus came to give us uh, the bread and the wine to fulfill Passover for us. And here was Melchizedek standing there, this kingly priest bearing bread and wine and offering it to uh, Abraham to partake of. And it's this priesthood that of course, that Jesus is part of and we become part of. Now, 
I don't know whether Jesus was Melchizedek. Um, I personally feel he probably was, but I do understand the arguments and the arguments are how can he be Melchizedek and how can he be of the order of Melchizedek? And the Jewish people think that Melchizedek was actually Shem. But, you know, Jesus can do anything. You know, after all, when Jesus died and went before the father in his high priestly role, carrying the blood that he had shed before the throne of grace, he was that Passover lamb and he was the mediating priest all at the same time. So, you know, who knows with Jesus? He's he can do anything, can't he? But you see, we were all meant to be a priesthood, just as as the Israelites uh, were meant to be, I believe, a kingdom of priests. And we know that that only um, happened after the cross, because when Peter wrote his epistle, he says this in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are, not you will be, and one day in heaven you will be, but he says you are, and it was fulfilling everything that should have happened in Exodus 19. And of course, John wrote in, in the book of Revelation that God made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve. Uh, the, his God and Father, Jesus is God and Father. Now, you know, I love, I love putting bits of the um, scriptures together because I, you know, each person in in our scripture had only a piece of the truth, and that's why it's like a massive jigsaw puzzle, and we need to put all these pieces together and see who is a prophetic type of Christ and how that works out and what God is really saying through different people's lives. I mean, sometimes um, it was what they did, sometimes it was what they said, and sometimes it was who they are. You know, it was they had to almost um, live like Hosea, you know, he had to take an adulterous wife because God had got an adulterous wife. So there's all these different types in scripture. And of course, one of the main ones that portrays this anointing of Melchizedek is, is King David. And David was a prophetic type, if you like, of, of Jesus um, because he was a king, he was of the tribe of Judah, but there were two occasions he acted in a priestly role. He went into the Holy of Holies with his men when they were hungry and ate the showbread. They weren't meant to do that. They weren't meant to go into the holy place. They, were, they, were, um, they weren't Levites, but they went in and they ate the showbread. And also when he brought um, the ark, remember when he brought the ark into Jerusalem, David was wearing linen and ministering before the ark of God. So he was acting in this priestly role, even though he was Judah and even though he was king. Um, there was another king who tried to um, act in a priestly role and it didn't work out so well for him. And that king was King Uzziah. And you will read in Isaiah 6, we quote it very often, not in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Well, Uzziah died of leprosy because he dared to go into the holy place to uh, burn incense before the Lord. And he wasn't meant to. And the priests were really, really upset about that. But why did Uzziah get struck down? And yet David could act in this way. So, you know, different people had different callings and it's all about obeying God and only doing what he tells us to do. Now, 
one thing that that really really spoke to me was the whole baptism of Jesus and I don't know about you but when there's a scripture that nags me I kind of like to do what Mary did store it in your heart and keep going back to the Lord and saying Lord I know that there's a lot more in this scripture than I'm seeing right now and um, I'm sure that's happened to, to many of you. Um, the one scripture that that really um, keeps coming back to me, let me just read it to you. It was in Matthew's uh, uh, gospel, and it's when Jesus is coming to down to the Jordan to be baptized. And the scripture is that when, you know, John says, you should baptize me, it shouldn't be the other way around. But Jesus says, let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And I thought there's something deep in this scripture, there's something a lot more in this scripture than I've ever really, really understood. I mean, John the Baptist, here he was. I mean, he was a very odd character, wasn't he, in many, many ways. But here he was in the River Jordan, baptizing people, calling them back to God, paving a way. Um, the cousin of, jo of Jesus. And... Um, you know, I mean, his father, his father, of course, was Zachariah, who, you know, when he went into the holy place to minister, had the encounter with the angel. And, and from Luke's gospel, it, he was told this, and you, my uh, child, will be called, the, this is uh, John, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And, um, you know, what a, what a promise that that John was going to go before the Lord. He was the one that Isaiah talked about, um, the voice in the wilderness paving a way for the Lord. And here was John standing by the River Jordan. And one thing I've, I always love to do is put myself into the passages that you read. Imagine you're standing there. What do you see? What do you feel? Imagine you're part of that crowd. And there was a big crowd waiting around, wanting to hear from John. They hadn't heard from the Lord for a long time. And now this man, not in the temple, not in Jerusalem, but here by the River Jordan, prophesying and talking about uh, one that was coming. And John stands there and he looks up and he says these incredible words he says behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world and you can just imagine the people around the jordan thinking to themselves a lamb well a lamb is something that we put on the sacrifice altar in the temple what does he mean lamb of god uh, who takes away the sin? Where is the lamb? And of course, the 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 lambs that were slain in the temple only dealt with Israel um, sins. And and John said he takes away the sin of the world. And you can imagine these people turning round, expecting to see a lamb, and they see a man. And this man is Jesus, and he's coming towards them. And John, this incredible character who Jesus says, you know, there's none greater, um, filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, which again was incredible. And here he is about to baptize Jesus in the Jordan. 
And what was going on there? There was something happening, I believe, that was very, very big. And this is something that's only come to me recently and I've researched re uh, only recently. I didn't put two and two together, and I'm sure you have, but it, it somehow never dawned on me and obvious that John the Baptist was, of course, a Levite. He was the son of a Levi priest. And yet he was not ministering in the temple. He was ministering here by the Jordan. And um, he, he was going to baptize Jesus in the Jordan. So what was actually happening? And you see, I believe that right at this moment in that Jordan River was a transferal of priesthood because the Levitical priesthood would come to an end and the Melchizedek priesthood was coming in with Jesus. And it had to be a Levitical priest who anointed the next priest to take over the priesthood, a better priesthood, a priesthood that has an endless life, that has no beginning and no end. And it was at that, that was the whole point. And that's why Jesus said, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness, because this was a big moment that was going on in the River Jordan. And you see, when a priest passed over the priesthood, you know, in the Levitical, it always went through a lineage. So a, a father would pass it on to a son. And when a priest was anointed to become a priest, three things happened. First of all, he needed a mikvah. Secondly, he would be anointed with oil. And thirdly, the father priest would have to declare he's his son. And so we go back to the River Jordan. Jesus is coming in for his baptism. He's going into the waters, the mikvah. He is being washed. And although Jesus had no sin, every priest had to have a mikvah. So Jesus went into the water, was washed as a mikvah. And furthermore, every priest had to be 30 years old. And Jesus was 30 years old at the River Jordan. He waited till he was 30. The anointing oil that came upon the, the Levitical priests was symbolic of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And what happened is Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed him. And Jesus could quote Isaiah 61 and say, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news, da, 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 to fulfill his priestly role. And then the heavens open. And Father God in heaven says, this is my son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. It's the confirmation of his calling. It's the confirmation that he is the son of God. Everything was happening at that moment in the Jordan River. And that's why this moment um, it, it was the most, it was so important. It was so incredibly important that righteousness was being fulfilled at that moment. And as God spoke those words from heaven, this is my son from Psalm 2, whom I love. What Abraham spoke over Isaac, the sacrifice, and with him I'm well pleased. Isaiah, quoting Isaiah from the suffering servant. So the whole calling of, of Jesus was, was being spoken, the kingly authority, the sacrifice, and the suffering servant was spoken over him at that point. But furthermore, that particular spot where it is believed that John the Baptist 
was baptizing is said to be the same spot that Joshua crossed over the Jordan. And if you go to Israel today, they will take you to, to roughly that place to baptize you if you want to be baptized. And it was at that spot that Joshua, a type of Jesus, his name, Yeshua, it's derived, it's the same savior name. And Joshua was going to lead the people of God from captivity into the promised land. He was the one who would cross over into the promised land. And our Jesus helps us to cross over from the world into the kingdom of God. And here, Joshua was um, told by God to cross over. And how he crossed over, he had to get the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant, which is symbolic of um, the presence of God. Wherever the Ark was, that was the Shekinah glory of God. That was where God's presence was. And they had to carry the Ark into the Jordan. And the priests went beforehand and they stood in the middle of the Jordan and the river, of course, um, opened up and uh, the rest of the people could go across. And then they were called to take the 12 stones as memorial stones and uh, build a memorial of what had happened. But you see, um, let me just go back to uh, Joshua here when the rivers uh, uh, dip, um, opened. It says here in Joshua 3, verse 15, now the Jordan is in flood all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It pied piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam. Nothing in scripture is there for no reason. And this town called Adam is, is fairly near Jericho. Um, that was the location. And as they stepped in, why does it say the waters retreated back to a town called Adam? And I believe the fulfillment is this, is when Jesus was baptized in that spot by his cousin, he is our great high priest, the order of Melchizedek, who not only did the river of sin go back to Adam, if you like, but he took on the whole sin of the whole world that goes all the way back to Adam. And the, I believe that's why that town is mentioned in Joshua, because Jesus took sin, it, not just the waters retreating, but sin retreating all the way back to Adam. Because when Jesus present, presented his blood before the Father, that blood was enough for every single human, whoever was, whoever is, and whoever will be. That's how powerful the blood of Christ is. And nothing is for nothing. The river went back to Adam and uh, the sin of mankind all the way back to Adam. And, um, you know, because of what he's done, because of what Jesus has done, and because of this amazing priesthood, this endless uh, kingly priesthood that we are now partakers of, you all and me, we're all priests of the order of Melchizedek, a greater priesthood, a higher priesthood, a more powerful priesthood than ever the Levitical could be. The Levitical was good, but the Melchizedek is amazing. And I, I'm just going to 
pull this to uh, a bit of an end, I think, um, with Deuteronomy 10, verse 8. It says, at that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister and to pronounce blessings in his name. And this, I believe, is the calling fulfilled in the greater priesthood of Melchizedek. The Levites had to carry the presence of God on poles in the form of the ark, where the ark went, the Shekinah glory went. The presence of God now is within us. It, in scripture, it says, you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that word is you are now the, the holy of holies. You have now the glory of God in you. It's Christ in you. The presence of God is in us. And wherever we go, whether we feel like it or not, we're called to carry the presence of God. And it's that presence that can change things around us because that presence is so powerful. He that is within you is greater than he that is in the world because the presence of God is in us. And the calling of the Levit Levitical priest was to minister to God. And that is important for us, isn't it? It's worshipping God. It's putting him first, fixing our eyes on Jesus, looking for him first of all, making him the most important, ministering to him, and then releasing blessing. And that's really why we wrote the blessing books, <laughs> because blessing is so powerful. God blessed mankind. The first thing he did when he made Adam was he blessed him. First thing he did when Noah came out the ark was to bless him. The first thing he did to Abraham was to, to bless him. And even when he was, I love this, even as he was going up to heaven at the end of the book of Luke, he was praying a blessing over them as he left, as he departed. So blessing is important. And because of the example of Jesus, and because he fulfills everything in every way, we are part of this amazing, amazing priesthood of God. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you that you have called each and every one of us to be partakers, Lord, of this incredible kingly, priestly priesthood of Melchizedek, the priesthood that will never, ever end, the priesthood of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for this commission that you give us to be uh, a priest of God most high. We are called to carry your presence. We're called to minister to you. And we're called to be a blessing on the face of the earth. And Father God, I pray for each and every one of us to fulfill that in every way that you have ordained that we will do it. And we give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory that's due your amazing and wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.